Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nicole Fernandez. I am the project manager of the Maternal Infant Health Series at Wayside Recovery Center. And you are here today to participate in a session on prenatal childbirth education as an underutilized leverage in improving maternity care. So we're gonna be listening today about how to access uh, opportunities in this childbirth education uh, state system. So we know they'll be different across the country, um, but we know that um, Ms. Jill Woodnick will be sharing with you some great information today. A little bit about Jill. Jill Woodnick is a maternal health policy expert focusing on high value and respectful maternity care systems change. As a past chair of advocacy and collaboration with Lamaz International, she has partnered for federal policy changes, including breastfeeding equity, paid parental leave, and early relational health. She was recently a short-term consultant to Every Mother Count, Counts, for the Institute of Medicaid Innovations, focusing on curriculum design for Medicaid reimbursement for birth doulas. Her other area of policy work includes supporting the midwifery model of care, birth centers, and prenatal childbirth. Jill has collaborated with the community, many community-based organizations, faith-based entities, as well as speaking to the U.S. Breastfeeding Coalition 2020 Moms, the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, and the NJ Perinatal Quality Collaborative. Her experience as a longtime birth doula keeps her rooted in the art and science of labor support. Jill articulates environmental justice and intersectional approaches for community care and well being. And when not on Zoom, she is a longtime student of ethnobotany, and she can be found appreciating the parks, trails, and rivers in New Jersey. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Ms. Jill Woodman. Take it away. Thank you so much, Nicole, and thank you to everyone gathered together. I'm just so, I'm so honored and touched to have what I hope is an ongoing conversation about all of the ways that maternity care is being transformed. I'm honored to speak today about one role and one lever of childbirth education and how that is centered in safe and healthy births. And as I do this, I really want to bring forth and honor some of the research you're going to see is by one of my mentors that just passed away a few days ago, Dr. Judy Lothian. So for all who are in New Jersey and who have legacy with Seton Hall University and the research that she did nationally, I really hold her as we gather today. So let's begin. We uh, are really here in the words of poet Linda Hogan to restore the broken agreements. That's a phrase that keeps me rooted and urgent about moving intentionally, carefully, and systemically for all ways that maternity care can be just. I come back to the words of Adrienne Marie Brown, who's also a doula, who uses the paradigm of emergent strategy as a way of framing complex situations that don't have a simplistic or one-way solution. But even with those complex systems, it doesn't mean that there can't be interventions that we can make. And making interventions that can be relational, and improve meaningful experiences. And so that's how I see childbirth education as part of a whole. And it's important to recommend that it's only part of the whole, not the end all be all. As I was getting to know Nicole and preparing for our time together today, just on September 1st, vital signs from the CDC reminded us of research from last spring that approximately one in five mothers overall, 30% Black, Hispanic, and multiracial mothers reported mistreatment during maternity care. Approximately 40% of Black, Hispanic, and multiracial mothers reported, reported discrimination during maternity care. And 45% of all mothers 
reported holding back from asking questions or discussing concerns with their provider. We know that the burden should not be on the consumer, that we are in a system that does not often align with quality or choice, with the Lancet reminding us that maternity care is this too much too soon and too little too late. And everyone is caught in the crossfire. Even the setting in which birth takes place is important. A federal document a few years ago wrote care during pregnancy, childbirth and early life are important parts of the US healthcare system. But some childbearing women and newborns do not reliably receive care that is safe, evidence-based and appropriate. We need to have an emergent strategy that's interdependent that takes all of these issues into account. Because as Motherboard wrote, birth in the United States is a complicated issue. Birth plans as defined in the purple circle shows more of this dichotomy. Birth plans, 98% of birthing people believe that birth plans mean better outcomes whereas 65% of providers and staff believe that birth plans have worse outcomes. And those are only some of the dichotomies, the role of racism, the role of payment issues, the role of over-medicalization, parents not feeling heard, and providers overworked, overwhelmed, and understaffed. Birth in the United States we know is a complicated issue and the perinatal quality improvement, and you'll get these slides, um, Dr. Bingham and her team did this, which reminds us what surrounds us shapes us with societal, communal, community factors, relationship and individual factors. So what do we do with this? Even with what surrounds us shapes us, I believe we have an important opportunity to nevertheless center health literacy, health education, understanding of quality, and really looking at the role of childbirth education as part of the whole. And seeing that in all of the levers that need to be accelerated, childbirth education has been underutilized so we have a really intersectional opportunity when we come together today to, to focus on consumers and to focus on state systems. Okay, so the, the image on the right from the educated birth, uh, you know, I could just look at all day. It's inside your pregnant body. And the journey to birth, you know, I hope that we do meet again. And I'm, I'm, I really tried not to do anatomy and physiology today, but I had to start, right? I had to start with recognizing and showing um, that childbirth education is grounded and rooted in anatomy and physiology and really showing and documenting the changes of the bladder, right? And the intestines of, you know, that where the uterus is and non-pregnant versus when you have a full-term baby. And so, I want to, although I'm not going to spend a lot of time on anatomy and physiology today, I want to let you know that that's what it's centered in. Childbirth education really teaches about the body. And evidence-based childbirth education really gives a plurality of understanding pros and cons, risks and benefits, and just the journey for birth. So part of what childbirth education has an opportunity to do is also elevate the outliers of what is normal physiology and why we would want consumer tools. Here's an example from the Preeclampsia Foundation um, that, you know, in my worldview, I feel like we could elevate this in our local libraries without wanting to scare, right, or overwhelm. But when we, and again, I'm looking at data from New Jersey where we know that this is a public health issue based on our data. So we want families to know headaches, seeing spots, swelling, 
stomach pain. We, you know, I go back to the recent data from Vital Signs. If we have 45% of all women not feeling that they're asking their questions, internally diminishing and dismissing because they don't feel safe or heard. Um, you know, there's so much of that to break down. But in the meantime, I do believe that we have underutilized tools and resources. So Lamaze International is one of many childbirth education ways of being. I'm going to explain a little bit about the six care practices for a safe and healthy birth from Lamaze, because that's one of the um, ways that I was formed. And so the six care practices of a safe and healthy birth very much align with ACNM and ACOG in terms of their philosophy and birth practices. And so there's six of them. Let labor begin on its own, walk around, change positions throughout labor, bring a loved one for continuous support or doula care, avoid interventions that are not medically necessary, follow your body's urge to push, not just non-supine positions, and of course, keeping the mother and baby together. I'm going to focus on the second one. I, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to focus on the first one, which is let labor begin on its own. Because again, under the range of what we see in public health, we see alarming rates of preterm labor. So making sure that families understand the role and value of a full term baby. March of Dimes gives us so many infographics in multiple languages. This is an old one that I've used for since they put it out because it helps families understand that a baby's brain at 35 weeks weighs only two thirds of what the baby's brain will weigh at 39 to 40 weeks. And when you really see this and you see the difference physiologically in the brain development there's a lot of opportunities to, you know, and then again, of course, knowing the first three years of life with the brain, but focusing on that perinatal period, because that can, again, give a segue so families can understand the signs and symptoms of preterm labor. Again, thanks to the March of Dimes, um, they have infographics that really help, excuse me, that really make sure that women and families are not dismissing if they're feeling um, constant low backache. Well, you know, I have three kids and I do remember being pregnant and you do get a lot of backache, right? So it's the discernment. It's that discernment of making sure, but if you're getting belly cramps with or without diarrhea, they write the feeling that the baby's pushing down, changes in discharge, water breaking, all of these reasons would be important to make sure that there is communication with the healthcare provider. So I like to use these tools that are in that are out there in the public domain as a way of making sure we have appropriate intervention but not over intervention. Because labor induction nationally is a very common procedure um, in my state it's very very high. So nationally, and this comes from Lamaze International, one in four women have um, labor induced, but many inductions are occurring for no medical reason. And again, this should not be the consumer's job, right? However, this is the ecosystem that birth is happening in. So it's important that consumers understand that inductions pose increased risk, including stress on baby, longer, harder labor, increased NICU stay, prematurity, risk of hemorrhage, 15% of parents feeling under pressure, right? So we want families to feel whatever birth asked for them, they got respectful, high value, equitable care that was safe and appropriate because there's a role for labor induction, but we don't want it all of the time. And that is the role of health literacy to understand one's body and to be able to have agency to ask for what we need and in a culture and community that supports it. I appreciate Dr. Peralta who gave me consent and permission to share her tool for consumers. This is available in English, Spanish, 
and Haitian Creole. And again, it's a, it's a shared decision-making tool to be used in childbirth education about inductions. What happens when someone's at 39 weeks and there's no medical reason why there would be a clinical read for induction, but that's what the consumer is being told by the healthcare provider. So this, you know, really, again, helps everyone's individuality of their preferences and their health history be expressed with greater public health outcomes. Another tool that is really helpful is just visual images of different options for birth. One of the things I was sharing was birth in the non-supine position. So this is from motherboard and it shows the role of peanut balls. It shows the role of um, you know, using exercise balls. All of these things, whether someone wants to rest in bed or be in bed or is using epidural anesthesia, you know, these are, you know, peanut balls are being more and more integrated into labor and delivery. But it's nice not to just give someone a peanut ball that they may have never held before, but to really have some anticipatory guidance and even try some positions. Listen, most of us probably have elders or grandparents that didn't take childbirth education. I'm gonna make an assumption that historically we've seen more childbirth um, and mammal birth, right? When we were more agrarian and we were more community focused. And you know, now childbirth education helps understand and explain different anticipatory guidance mechanisms that were not previously um, available or maybe even needed because birth was seen and birth was in community. And so now when birth really moved out of community into clinical facilities, you know, this, you know, this can really help. I'm not talking today a lot about pain coping practices and having contractions. I mean, that's that's the real heart and art, right, of, of childbirth education. But I'm trying to go through the value of sharing tools and embedding childbirth tools in your current programs. One of my favorites, unfortunately, thank goodness, was launched by the March of Dimes in the beginning of the pandemic three and a half years ago. And this was a consumer tool that really gives consumers questions to ask. Have there been any changes to the facilities labor and delivery policies? I'm located 12 miles from New York City and our hospitals in Northern New Jersey outside of Manhattan immediately had to pivot. They had to pivot in terms of postpartum discharge planning. They had to pivot in terms of policies and procedures. And this tool, like, will the baby be tested for COVID-19? Um, I'm still using three and a half years later, partly because there's questions on this tool from the March of Dimes, like, can I bring a partner or support person with me? In New Jersey, it really did take an executive order to make sure that doula care was codified and able to be and so and 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 to have that. So this um, is about the system of where childbirth where, where childbirth is taking place, and it helps families ask questions, which is also really par and par parcel for engagement. But childbirth education can also really cover the specifications of what parents are asking about. I've been a childbirth educator for more than 20 years and it's really okay. And I welcome when parents are saying, um, I don't know what to think about birth. I've never had a baby before. Is it gonna hurt, right? And so motherboard birth um, has some slides, most childbirth education do, where they put together explanations of different elements, procedures, and tools that consumers may or may not be exposed to or want to ask for at their place of birth, including using the benefits and the risks. So this is just one example with nitrous. You know, the benefit is it's simple to administer, metabolizes quickly, but there's also side effects, right? Um, there could be some dizziness. And so individualizing the benefits and risks. So someone who recently had ear surgery would not be appropriate for nitrous oxide, um, but it doesn't limit mobility. So there's no agenda. The agenda is 
to make sure that everyone has informed education and can really understand what they need for a safe and healthy birth. I am so grateful that AWAN a few years ago started publishing the post-birth warning signs. I look forward to being in maternity care when we don't need this. But in my state and nationally, we really do desperately need to teach about the post-birth warning signs. Um, this is a tool that in light green gives families a script. I had a baby on whatever date and I am having whatever symptom. Just that communication can become that important not to diminish or dismiss symptoms because we know the year after birth is a critical period of making sure that signs and symptoms are listened to. So this tool has, you know, again, available in multiple languages. I know in New Jersey, we have some hospitals that are giving magnets. You know, it's a, it's, I wish we didn't need this, but we do. And um, I hold this with the sensitivity that we know so much of maternal morbidity and mortality can be prevented. And so if this is a tool that I will have a family that's willing to call their healthcare provider because there's a headache that doesn't get better, even after taking medicine and a bad headache with vision changes, I don't want that to be dismissed or belittled internally or externally in the system. This is just another example about um, also signs and symptoms in terms of um, perinatal mood disorder, things that are not maybe not as visible as, a, as an incision or a fever. Again, this is just a sample from motherboard that says, um, if you or your partner are concerned that you need extra help with postpartum mood changes, call your provider and check some of these online resources. Um, this was done before the new federal hotline, but they have um, PSI and the Postpartum Stress Center to text in English and Spanish. So this is an example of how things can be regionally adapted, both for national as well as very local, local resources. Because part of what this brings us to are quality indicators. And this should not be on the burden of the consumer, but consumers should know and understand the environment of birth. So some of the overused procedures include things like episiotomy, rupturing membranes, and some of the underused procedures include non-supine positions, early skin-to-skin -skin contact. Um, it really took in 2014 changing our hospital regs to make sure that the mother-baby dyad was, was staying together. So we are, you know, we're the fact that that we are still, it's still an underused procedure in the United States. Um, says a lot, right? We have a lot of opportunity to improve the quality and the outcomes, the experience, and the satisfaction. So this came out years ago. Um, this, and I should say, this infographic that I teach almost every week is part of a much larger website from um, California. You can check that out because there's videos, there's reports. But for childbirth education, to help consumers with just four indicators of what's a high quality birth. I appreciate that this used four indicators, the low risk cesarean birth, the episiotomy rate, exclusive breastfeeding at discharge and vaginal birth after cesarean. So, these four indicators, and of course, these are fictitious consumers, but this is a great way of looking at real data. And this is years ago, but it's still helpful. So Sarah goes to a high performing hospital and Maya is going to a low performing hospital. And what does that mean? How do consumers understand this? Well, just these four indicators tell a really important story. A low risk cesarean birth, the lower rate is better. Sarah going to a birthing facility where it's 19% low risk C-section, Maya going to 56%.
These are real numbers. And I can tell you, although this was from California, we have the exact data. And, the, and again, this is older, but it's transforming in New Jersey. So reducing NTSV was one of our perinatal quality collaborative areas of focus. And so many states, and you're going to hear a little bit more about that. Um, episiotomy. Episiotomy for ch in childbirth education, either eyes are going to go real wide or people are literally going to uh, feel they don't want to know. It's very traumatizing. Even to explain, um, it's a surgical procedure in the perineum between the anus and vagina, and that the lower number is better because there could be complications afterwards. And so Sarah is going to a hospital with a 2% episiotomy rate. Maya is going to a hospital with a 46% episiotomy rate. Fictitious people, but not fictitious data. This is, again, parallel to where I live and work, where we have these discrepancies. Exclusive breastfeeding on discharge and vaginal birth after cesarean. And for those two, the higher rate is better. We want exclusive breastfeeding on discharge if that's the family's request. And of course we want vaginal birth after cesarean. So this is just a way of explaining quality for consumers. But what about quality for systems? What about quality for entities, state programs, and other indicators? Well, this was a slide that Dr. Jennifer Vanderlyn did when she and I were presenting years ago in the Maternal Health Hub. We were doing this similar topic, and she put this slide together and gave me consent to share it, because childbirth education is really a strategy to meet quality and safety goals. So whether you're here under a hat of Title V or Title X, through the Joint Commission, Healthy People, even LeapFrog, right? Um, so we have all of these indicators that we know childbirth education can be a very important tool at. And of course, when we're talking about systems, we have to talk about the role of the payer, which again could be a standalone conversation. I just want to give a couple of slides um, and I want to focus on uh, Medicaid through the KFF report that usually comes out every three years. Um, there's a lot on this slide, but this is, I, I love all of their reports, um, but I put a little star and a red arrow because the second part of their slide under counseling and support services, which is blue, reminds us um, that interest in doula care coverage is growing. More and more states are doing state plan amendments or having other mechanisms um, for funding doula care through Medicaid. Most states are covering prenatal and postpartum home visits for some beneficiaries. But here we go. Minority of states cover childbirth and infant care classes. So this is not my opinion that childbirth education is underutilized. Unfortunately, we, we really see if we are looking from a payer perspective at Medicaid, that this is just, this is a way to, to really get some traction. So I wanna go a little bit deeper into that report um, because the states that they looked at and they, they really looked at childbirth education, 15 out of 42, infant care or parenting classes and group prenatal care. Um, and those are all of course, different iterations. Um, you know, group prenatal care is gonna have assessment, diagnostic and be with a licensed healthcare provider. Whereas childbirth education or parenting classes can be done with peer support. But we're really still seeing um, that there's, there's discrepancy in what's covered and it's really just underutilized. Um, and then some of, some of what is being able to be covered is really interesting. Um, so for example, Colorado limits childbirth, and this is with the red arrow here, Colorado limits childbirth and parenting education only during routine prenatal visits. And it would be interesting to hear from our Colorado, um, if anyone's here from Colorado, is that something that the providers like or do they have an office childbirth educator embedded? I'm really interested in, in the science of implementation um, because I believe this should be a, a really large 
work group, a national work group that really looks at the role of pairs in childbirth education and parenting classes, because there's a lot of complexity and a lot of um, state by state variation. Wisconsin only provides childbirth education and parenting to um, if they're enrolled in the state's prenatal care coordination for those who are higher risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes. So that's, I mean, it's interesting. And I, again, I really hope that, you know, within the next few years, we can have some national report outs and um, policy recommendations for, for the role of payers. We know that Healthy People 2030 really gives an opportunity um, to look at outcome measures and see how all of these outcome measures have a unique role for childbirth education. Um, and this is an example, my mentor and my colleague and friend, Tara Owens Schuler um, from North Carolina shared, we used to be on a work group together um, that in North Carolina, their 2030 plan ensures group prenatal care, childbirth education, and doula services are covered by prepaid health plans. And what I appreciate is that childbirth education is singled out. If childbirth education is not singled out, it can be dismissed. It can be just considered someone else's job. Let's just throw it to community health workers and doulas. I'm a longtime doula. So um, I, you know, and of course doulas are, and there, of course, everybody needs to be able to do childbirth education, but not every family is going to have or want or be able to afford a doula. So childbirth education as a standalone integrated opportunity becomes really important. This is just, again, these national performance measures by regions. And um, when we look at the role of childbirth education, this is an old slide um, about cesarean births on low risk cesarean uh, or low risk women and how different states were really looking and doing strategies. And what's interesting is that this isn't just changing the provider behavior or the culture, that's all important, but childbirth education as well as doula care and other peer support becomes important. So the there's a toolkit to support vaginal birth and reduce primary cesarean births from California that was updated last autumn. And, you know, it's really worth looking at because so many states are still really struggling um, with low risk cesarean births. And there's a lot of reasons to keep that as a performance measure. And that's something that really needs childbirth education, right? Because if we don't understand the process of physiologic birth, um, and you're gonna see this at the end, there's a difference in terms of consumer request for cesarean birth when families have taken childbirth education and when they haven't. So, you know, again, what's the big deal with cesareans? We know that we want some of them some of the time, we need them, they can be life-saving, but we don't wanna overuse uh, you know, I used to work at um, in a part of New Jersey where one of the birthing facilities had a 59% cesarean birth rate. I'm not kidding. It's public data. It's not safe. It's not equitable, right? So just when states just focus on reducing cesarean births, um, it really helps consumers understand the risks, and then of course, appropriately the benefits when they're needed. Um, but again, this has to be embedded in all of systems change. We're never gonna overburden the consumer. We always go back to what surrounds us, shapes us. Um, and that consumers are in maternity care are trying to get high value, respectful, equitable childbirth care. Um, and it's complex, right? I go back to Adrienne Marie Brown. I go back to complex problems don't have simple solutions, but that doesn't mean there's not interventions. And childbirth education is an easy intervention, partly because so many resources are free. So I loved um, about two years ago, I was able to uh, be one of a plurality of people working with Every Mother Counts for a series in English and Spanish called Choices in Childbirth. 
You can watch it all on YouTube, but they also have um, a dedicated page, uh, a number of web pages where you can download consumer materials for partners, even for grandparents. Um, and they have really good uh, topics like the difference between midwives and doulas, navigating hope and fear, um, you know, individuals speaking directly about their postpartum mental health concerns and about you know, really listening and watching what happens in quality prenatal care and some wonderful handouts. So this is free childbirth education on demand. Um, and so, you know, I hope if there's anything you take from our time together, just going to this, I think will help add value as you think about how you can really have dedicated staff, dedicated time to incorporate where you are in the landscape of maternity care systems change for equitable care. A couple other ones. Um, uh, you've heard me talk about Lamaze. They have um, in English and in Spanish on mothersadvocate.org videos and handouts. Um, there's also uh, Ready, Set, Baby, which is um, a prenatal education, really focusing more on breastfeeding, but we know that birth impacts breastfeeding. And so some of that will come up. Um, Enjoy has information, the educated birth, motherboard. This is not at all a comprehensive list. It was just a list of, um, you know, things that are on my computer that, that really share birth physiology that teach about a placenta um, in an inclusive literacy way. And there's so many more. So what, this is incomplete. So I would love you putting in the chat um, organizations that you work with for consumer education. Be, because designing and centering and reimagining high quality, respectful care is so urgent. And there are so many people who have reminded us for years, we start with the end in mind of undoing racism, eliminating poverty, investing in mental health and social support, the entire, the entire life, pers uh, life course perspective. So I'm gonna end so I can get to questions with um, again, a reminder of Childbirth education, here are the six evidence practices from Lamaz, but you know, they are in alignment with all other, they're, they're um, about safe and ch childbirth and how it, the using childbirth education for shared decision-making, we increase health literacy, patient engagement, patient safety, and we reduce healthcare costs and health disparities. And as a country, as we shift from volume to value-based care, here's the secret sauce, the 35% reduction in requests for elective cesarean births, 28% reduction in unplanned cesareans, reduction in postpartum complications, increase in breastfeeding initiation and duration, increase in satisfaction with care, and increase in mental health during and after pregnancy. I hope I have given you something that you need in your unique organization and your unique role to integrate and add prenatal childbirth education. Whether you're here as a payer, a provider, a consumer, a childbirth educator, um, this is everyone's work to do collectively. So I'm really glad to be here and um, I'm happy to answer questions and keep the conversation going. Thank you, Jill. What a great presentation. Um, and just really explaining to us and didacting um, and showing how uh, childbirth education, right? In its many forms and the many tools, how we can our reduced disparities and how we can improve outcomes for our moms um, in community. And I also really appreciate um, the fact that you're challenging us to also be aware in our local institutions where we see barriers or even in the organizations we're interfacing as well as the healthcare um, 
community. So I do see the chat uh, lighting up. I see a lot of thank yous. I see a lot of incredible um, presentation that you are appreciated. Um, I do see one question in the Q&A. So please put your questions in the Q&A and I will circle back to the chat. So Helen is asking, how do we give birth information to consumers long before pregnancy? Normal birth information should be available in college classes and better yet a way to get the info into high schools. And so I'm just gonna jump right in here, Helen. I just saw that Massachusetts has updated their sexual health education. And I'm gonna use that as a tool to ask our state, right? What are we changing? Um, because I agree that it should definitely be in high school and college, but I'm going to turn it over to Jill. What a great question, Helen. I totally agree. And that's part of why centering anatomy and physiology about pregnancy um, really is part of reproductive health and reproductive justice, um, because we want to make sure that pregnancies are wanted and we want to know how to prevent unplanned pregnancy and really, again, all of these things and, and the small amount of anatomy and physiology that's usually in like a 10th grade health class in no capacity um, is, is stored for pregnancy. But I think, you know, I think what's really interesting as um, birth justice movements really see birth as part of movement work, um, that, that there are opportunities for childbirth education and just the entire spectrum of human sexuality to be taught throughout the lifespan with appropriate ages and stages. Um, so I would love to hear, uh, you know, and I know that like um, young people like community colleges and colleges are are doing some really important innovation on preconception health. Um, and I'm sure there's some stuff out there on childbirth education and pregnancy as well. I'd love to hear about that. So Jill, some people were asking if you could, if we could put the resources in the chat. Um, it, I'm not sure if you mentioned additional resources, but everyone will be able to get the slides also within the next 24 hours. And then um, Sarah Hambright is asking, what was the website you mentioned with the birth ball positions? Great job today and great information. I think I'm still sharing my screen. So some of the videos and the downloadables are from Choices in Childbirth. Um, that's through Every Mother Counts. So if you just Google Choices in Childbirth, Every Mother Counts, it's on YouTube and it's on their website. And then it was probably motherboard birth um, there. And, and again, this is, you know, there's, there's really a lot of places that do beautiful childbirth education and birth photographers that will sell their rights to share. Um, but sometimes in terms of anatomy and physiology, um, I like it when there's both, you know, when you see the person and the family, and then you really see the stages of it. Like we haven't even, you know, based on time, I didn't go into, um, you know, effacement and dilation, but those are examples of anatomy and physiology that there's some really interesting stuff that people share or they, or they sell. Um, one of the other questions was, is there one organization that is leading the charge on elevating EBCBE? that we know or can follow or join, excuse me. You know, I, I would welcome everybody's response to that. Um, I mean, I mentioned a lot of them, right? I mentioned Lamaze, I mentioned evidence-based birth, I mentioned motherboard, there's Kappa. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there's one um, lead organization because childbirth education has, um, really been almost regional. Um, it's It's been based on what's happening at local birthing facilities as, you know, the internet, of course, has changed how um, resources are delivered. So, um, but there's there's really good ones. And it's, it's, you know, in my opinion, it's like, yes, and 
We need more child, just the same way we need more doulas. We need more childbirth educators because we need childbirth education, you know, embedded for second and third time parents in uh, childcare facilities, you know, because every pregnancy is going to be different and people are going to have different questions for um, subsequent births. I don't see anything else in the chat or the Q&A. I think we might have maybe time for one more question. If there's, um, okay, someone says just wanted to know if there was a one-stop organization as well. That question has come up a lot today. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm, I'm, um, I'm a Lamaze childbirth educator, but as you can see, I use any and all available resources. Um, you know, I was a birthing from within childbirth educator, you know, and still am very inspired and imprinted by that. When Lamaze really focused on safe and healthy birth practices, um, that was in the early 2000s. I don't know if Judy or anyone else here can, can um, or Tara can, can just fact check that in the chat. That became really important because the care practices for safe and healthy births were regardless of facility and were in alignment again with ACNM and ACOG. And so that, so, you know, it's not about how you breathe. Of course, relaxation and the hormones of birth are very, very important, but the care practices, I think became a really important leverage tool um, to look at this discrepancy between quality indicators and what consumers get. But I really wanna to defer to other people on here um, so I'm not just in my bias of, of being, um, a Lamaze childbirth educator, cause I use anything that, that I can. Thank you. Um, there was a comment. Helen says every educator or organization should give recognition to the others. It would be a help for consumers. Oh, absolutely. And again, I, I think because, um, Childbirth education is is always centered in anatomy and physiology. Um, we need all of the organizations. So that's why I really want to welcome people to list organizations that I haven't said in in the chat and really make it inclusive and braided together. Let's see. Um, uh, Amanda Little says she uses Enjoy um, as a resource, I believe. Yes, there's, I think that's the one pictured up here. With, there's an app and it says Understanding Birth. Wonderful. I know that there are some other apps and a lot of things that's happening in the technology space around supporting moms. I know Wallomi is one. Uh, African American nurse group out of Washington, D.C. They presented before, share some tools to walk alongside moms and give them information, as well as the Earth app for um, a for support for mothers' groups, whether it's working with doula or lactation consultants. And so I just um, feel like you really helped us to be very equipped today. And I just want to thank you again for this amazing presentation. Again, everyone, I apologize. I had internet difficulties. So I am in a coffee shop doing this right now. So I hope there hasn't been too much background noise when I am speaking. But I, Jill, I definitely want to thank you again. And I know that we're probably going to get surveys that says, we would like to have you back and maybe even dig a little deeper into this because it is about collaborative care and it is about us understanding how, um, I know one of the local conferences in Minnesota, we were learning from each other what was happening around doula reimbursement and people were sharing best practices on how to deal with that challenge. So thank you again for sharing this wonderful information and everyone for attending. You will receive all the documents within the next 24 hours. Um, and we hope that you will join us in an upcoming um, maternal infant health series session soon. And this has been sponsored by SAMHSA and the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, this is a state opioid 2 response grant. And uh, we are really happy to continue to partner 
uh, please share colleagues or information um, that you think that we should be presenting here. And I wish everyone a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone.